Okay, everybody, welcome to a special edition of Track Talk. Um, today, I'm going to, in honor of my dear friend and hero, Charlie Watts's 82nd birthday, which was yesterday, June 2nd, uh, today's episode of Track Talk is basically a style and analysis of Charlie. Um, I thought I would have someone on the show with me who really knows Charlie's playing, a, a lifelong fan. Um, and that person is me. So, <laughs> um, I was going to reach out to some other friends, uh, but I just thought I would just make a go of it by myself today. And I, and I hope, uh, no one is offended by not being invited to join me today, but you know, I had some specific ideas of what I want to cover. And, uh, so I'm going to just press forward. First of all, um, I want to show you guys, I have some drums set up behind me and, for this episode today, if you're listening to the podcast, I apologize, you can't see this, but um, I specifically brought in three of my, I have eight Gretsch drum sets, all vintage drum sets, and uh, three of them are more or less replicas of different Gretsch sets that Charlie has had. Uh, so let me just, I'm going to step aside. You can see the black Nitron kit in the background there. Um, Charlie started playing Gretsch. I'll back up a second. Charlie played Ludwig drums in the 60s, um, from, you know, the early 60s right up until 1968. In 1968, Charlie got his first Gretsch drum set, a black nitron kit. And this is kind of a little known uh, fact, I guess you could say, because you, you don't see this drum set in a lot of places. This particular black nitron, it's a round badge. It's a 1968 and so you can see this is Brian Jones was still in the band. If you have ever seen Rock and Roll Circus, uh, the Stones movie from 1968, you'll see Charlie playing this set. And Mitch Mitchell actually plays this kid as well. Um, so that's the first Gretsch set that Charlie owned. It's a black nitron round badge. The bass drum has eight lugs. I don't know if you can see. Here we go. The bass drum has eight lugs, which was kind of the norm for that time. It's a 9 by 13 mounted tom, 16, 16 floor tom, 14 by 22 inch bass drum. And I believe behind that tom tom is a 5 by 14 chrome over brass, 4165 or 4160 eight lug snare drum back in those days. So that's the first black, first Gretsch drum set that Charlie had. Uh, prior to that, he had, of course, his Ludwig sky blue pearl kit made famous in um, many videos and so forth. Am I, am I sharing that? Let's see. Yes, hopefully you're seeing that, the sky blue kit. Um, and that was the kit he had up till that time. And then for a period of time, Charlie used a hybrid version of both of those kits. Again, you know, if you follow sort of the history of, of, that period of 1968, 1969, they're recording Let It Bleed. There are pictures of Charlie using that hybrid kit at um, Hyde Park, the concert, the first concert with Mick Taylor, and Charlie is using the, um, he's using the, let me go back to that picture so I get this straight. Yes, he's using his Gretsch, black nitron bass drum and floor tom. The floor tom is upside down and he's using his sky blue nine by 13 tom and his Ludwig snare drum. So you can see that. All right. So that's a little, a little history there on, uh, on Charlie's drum. So I'm going to jump in here and show you some drum sets that I have. All right. You guys are with me so far. So right here I have, this is a early 1970s, 1972 Black Nitron stop sign badge kit, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, that's a 9 by 13, 16 by 16, 14 by 22, 5 by 14 metal snare. On this side, Charlie played a Black Diamond Pearl Gretsch set, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Made very famous on the Get Your Yeah Yeahs Out record and Gimme Shelter documentary movie. You'll see him playing his 1969 Black Diamond Gretsch set. 
And of course, most famously, Charlie's Maple Set. Now, mine is a 1969-1970 stop sign badge. Charlie's was a 1957 round badge. Uh, so a few differences, but, and the other difference, sorry, I'll go this way. <laughs> My set has a 9 by 13 Tom Tom. Charlie's has an 8 by 12 But otherwise, it's the same 14 by 22 inch bass drum, 16 by 16 floor tom. I have a DW wood snare, and uh, Charlie has, of course, in recent years, a DW snare as well. All right, so where I'm going with all this is I just wanted to take a minute and show you some of these different kits that he's used. Here's the, um, here's the Black Diamond Pearl kit I mentioned. This was actually from the Exile on Main Street 72 tour rehearsals in Montreux uh, in 1972, but he used this kit from 69 until his black stop sign badge Gretsch kit, my personal favorite kit that he that he had. But this is a very famous kit because it was used on Get Your Yeah Yeahs Out, as I mentioned. It was, rec it was used for the recording of Sticky Fingers and Exile on Main Street. They were all done with these drums. So to me, these are probably the most um, mojo-ish drums that Charlie played. I mean, when you think of those records that he made with these drums, it's, it's pretty incredible, to say the least. Um, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the black, the second black Gretsch kit. And this is the kit that he used in 72, 73 tours. And uh, on the Goat's Head Soup record, it's only rock and roll. And then in 1975, he started using the round badge bass drum that original black kit that I told you about, he started using the bass drum on that kit with the 72 stop sign badge Tom Toms. You want minutia? I'll give you minutia. Okay. And again, we've covered a lot of this stuff in the past. Um, I had uh, Richard King, my buddy Richard King on with me a while ago. We really got into this stuff pretty deep, but, um, but I think it's worth mentioning this. It's another shot of the, um, this is another shot of Charlie's Gretsch kit. This is from the stop sign badge kit from 72. And you can see in those days, again, he did not have the China. He played just a ride and a crash, both on his right side, 20 inch crash, 16, sorry, 20 inch crash ride, 16 inch crash. Um, you guys, you guys keeping up with me so far? I hope so. All right. I know I'm, I'm laying it on pretty thick here with all this uh, heavy-duty Charlie Watts trivia drum equipment. So I, so I showed you these drums. Uh, I'm going to just show you quickly. The cymbals were always a hard thing for me to ever get a straight answer from Charlie on. Try as I may, I, I would ask him pretty you know specific questions about what he used at different times. And... Um, you know, I, in, in all fairness, he could, he just couldn't remember. He'd say, I, I think I might've used this. I think I might've used that. And when I would say specifically, do you remember Charlie, if you played a Peisty giant beat at this point, he'd, he'd go, Oh, John, I don't know. I, I can't remember. So, but I will show you, um, a photo and this is a screenshot from 1972 where you can see clearly the giant beat logo on this ride symbol right here. And that's a, that's the Peisty giant beat. That's a 20 inch. And it sure sounds like it at that period of time from the late sixties into the early seventies. That was always my guess what that symbol was. Um, so that's, I'm going to go with that's what it, what, what he used on those records. Certainly what he used live at that time. Um, so again, I hope this is, you're finding this useful information. <laughs> Lee, you're welcome for the minutia. You know me, Lee. I'm the king of minutia. Look up the word minutia. You'll see my picture. All right. I'm going to get into some music in just a few minutes here. I want to just see if there's anything else I can share with you guys in the way of photographic evidence. Um, this is another shot of Charlie from 
I'd say about 1975. You can see his ride symbol at that time uh, was either a, it's a Peisty 2002, either a medium or possibly a ride. But you can see very clearly the, uh, the old hollow Peisty logo on that symbol right there. And again, that's, you know, that's circa 1975, maybe 76. I'm going with 75 on that one. Um, and to bring it up to sort of more modern times, where's that other photo? This is a photo that I personally took 10 years ago at the Boston Garden at Soundcheck. And it's a shot behind Charlie's drums. This was when he had just started using a Zildjian 20-inch Crash of Doom to his left above his hi-hat. You can see that. He has his UFIP China. He has his 18-inch flat ride. A 16-inch Zildjian Crash that I gave him in 2012 when they started their 50 and counting tour to replace the Peisty that he cracked in 2007. And that Peisty was about 50 years old when he cracked it. It's amazing it lasted as long as it did. It was a 602, uh, it was stamped as an Arbiter Custom 602 crash. Very thin. It's the crash you hear on all the, you know, the old hit records from the late 60s right on through. And then down here, he has another China. You can see another UFIP. But when he cracked that, he I had sent him one of these symbols way back when, when we, when I was working at Zildjian and we had first introduced them and he liked it quite a lot with other bands. So when he cracked his Peisty, we were actually having lunch one day when he told me about it. And, uh, I said, you know, we have some of those symbols. I'll send you one. And when it came time for them to gear up for this tour, his drum tech, Don McCauley contacted me and, um, and this symbol is what he used right up till the end. So it worked out just fine. It was very, very similar in pitch and feel and everything else, timbre as the Peisty 602. All right. Yes. All right. So thanks for hanging with me, everybody. I want to jump in for a minute. Actually, before I jump in, I do want to also reference a couple of really great books that you probably all know about these books. I think that shot for 75 flatbed truck, Ryan, I think you're probably right. I do have a shot from the flatbed truck to somewhere, you know, sort of an out front shot of the whole kit. And you can clearly see in that other shot that I'm, I didn't show you a round badge, eight lug bass drum. That would be the 68 black nitron bass drum with the stop sign badge, Tom Toms. And that is the kit that he used from that point forward until he went to the maple kit. And uh, I guess I, I didn't, I can show you just a, a shot of that as well. Um, well, I don't see one. What do you know? That's all right. We've, we've covered enough. We've covered enough. You know about the maple kit. I just, I showed you behind the, behind the kit view of it. So that's, that's good enough. All right. So a couple of things you probably know about these books. Sympathy for the Drummer, Why Charlie Watts Matters, Mike Edison, wrote this great book back in, uh, gosh, 2020, maybe I should know. Anyway, it's been around for a while. It's great. I've had Mike on my show live from my drum room. And, uh, Mike tells a great story about Charlie calling him to thank him for writing the book. It's pretty hilarious. Um, through the, you know, Don McCauley basically set that up so that he would call Mike and thank him for this book. And most recently, you probably know about this one. Uh, Paul Sexton has written this fantastic book, Biography on Charlie. Charlie's Good Tonight. Paul was also on Live from My Drum Room not too long ago. Um, totally, really recommend both these books for different reasons. Mike does a pretty good deep dive into Charlie's playing style and, and uh, you know, more into Charlie as a drummer. And where Paul talks about uh, Charlie the person, interviews all the members of the Stones and some former members and uh, Charlie's family. It's, a, it's, an, it's an authorized biography, so it has the cooperation and the approval of Charlie's family, which is huge. So there's incredible access to a lot of information that you probably would have never known if you 
didn't read this book. So highly recommended both of these books. And uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to jump into a couple of tunes here and, you know, and, and no particular order, but I, I just want to first set this song up a little bit. And the song I'm going to play is 19th Nervous Breakdown. So hard to pick songs because to me, they're all masterpieces, really. Everything Charlie did. This song is kind of an obvious choice because Charlie's really playing. I mean, he really stretches in this song and he really stretches out. And to me, it always, you know, it, it always uh, reminded me, I guess, if nothing else, of Charlie's jazz influence. We all know that he, you know, he's a jazz drummer at heart. And as I got to know him as a person and I saw how deep his knowledge and his love for jazz was, and as I, you know, grew and mature as a drummer myself and started to really know more about these other these drummers that he idolized so much, it really made me appreciate his playing even more. And in, in this particular song, you know, I, I, and I said this to him once and he sort of laughed. I think he, he took it as the compliment that I truly meant it as, but I told him that, um, you know, it reminded me of Elvin Jones. I said, you know, you sound like, you sound like Elvin Jones in this song. And he was, he kind of was, you know, sort of flabbergasted, like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Like, how, you know, how could you mention my name in the same sentence as Elvin Jones? I mean, he was a very humble guy, needless to say. But anyway, I'm going to play 19th Nervous Breakdown and um, just dig it for a second. You know, everybody talks about Charlie being uh, a laid back player and playing behind the beat. Um, this song, I think, is an example of him playing more on the beat. I, I wouldn't say he's playing on top or ahead of it. But give a listen. I mean, I, this is, I think, what was so great about Charlie was he was multidimensional. I, I don't think you could put him in a bag of just being this guy that, you know, only played behind the beat. He certainly, there were, there were plenty of songs where he played really laid back, and I'll, I'll give some examples of those as well. But, um, you know, to me, this song is like, it grooves, it doesn't rush it swings like nobody's business, and it's uh, it's really Charlie having a great time. So dig it. Let me know you're hearing it. Okay, here it comes.
hate to fade out Bill Wyman's great little bass run right there, but... All right, lots of great comments. I love it. I see some some great um, comments there, and uh, and and you know people that know Charlie's playing or are seeing or hearing things, and um, yeah, I mean, really great ride work first of all. And I never really fully understood or figured out the sticking, really what he's playing. And I I think and and some of some of you more um, school drummers probably could tell me, but it always sounded like a like a broken 16th note sort of pattern or maybe even like a triplet. And I think the, th the thing was like Ringo, Charlie would tend to break those things up a lot. Um, wouldn't play exactly the same thing over and over again. So I think he was just going for something to sort of fill the sound and to, to, um, to drive the band. Um, but you know, the, the drum fills, those syncopated, those big, you know, big crashing fills that he plays in there, you know, it's just, it's, you know, and that was 1960. They recorded that song in 1965. It was on the radio in 1966. Um, you know, pretty early into their, into the Stones career. And he was already really kind of stretching out. And I think that to me, that, that was my first indication of really what Charlie was made of. You know, I, I, he was much more than, uh, what meets the eye back in those days. Yeah, almost like a triplet, but then sometimes not. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, so the next song I'm going to jump ahead to is uh, a song recorded in 1969 with that hybrid drum kit I was telling you about. This would be with the Gretsch bass drum. Again, this is to the best of my estimation because we see photos during this period in 1969 when they were recording Let It Bleed. This became a big giant hit. And as I say, Charlie was using, by my estimation, his Gretsch bass drum, Ludwig Tom Tom, Ludwig snare drum, Gretsch floor tom. Uh, probably the giant beat, 20 inch crash ride, ride crash, definitely the 16 inch Peisty crash. Uh, don't know about the hi hats, they could be Zildjian A's. He once told me that he always mixed A Zildjian's. Back in the day, he said, I was always using some Zildjian's if I were, if I were using Peisty. And uh, I know he did have a preference for 14-inch, uh, you know, old 14-inch new beats. So it could have been those. They could have been 14-inch uh, 602 Peisty hi-hats. Don't know. As I said, God knows I, <laughs> I tried to find out many times to the point where I just had to, I was annoying him and I had to stop. So, uh, but this song, if you haven't guessed yet, is Honky Tonk Woman and... Um, you know, I, I, I don't mean to to, uh, to state the obvious. Maybe that's not even the right way to say it, but uh, I, I think some people assume this is Charlie playing the cowbell, but it's not. And I'm sure many of you people watching this right now, you educated, uh, well-versed Charlie Watts Rolling Stones fans know that this is the great Jimmy Miller who plays the cowbell. And Jimmy, of course, was their producer and no doubt had an idea of what the song was supposed to sound like. He was a he was a big presence in those days, and he was a big part of Charlie's um, drumming vocabulary. Charlie told me that he he really Jimmy really helped him a lot just to sort of come up with different ideas in the studio. He really pushed him to try different things. You know, Jimmy being a great drummer himself, and of course, everybody knows Jimmy played on "You Can't Always Get What You Want" and "Happy" and "Shine a Light," and um, we'll get to "Tumbling Dice" a little later where it's Charlie and Jimmy Miller. But this is Honky Tonk Woman, Jimmy Miller on the cowbell, and uh, check it out. The other thing I'll just point out before we get this song started is, again, all of us drummers know the tempo speeds up. It starts off at about 120 BPM, pretty solid 120. By the second verse, I did a little check on this. It jumps up. I thought it actually went faster. It jumps up to about 124 and by the time they get into the instrumental, it's at 126 and it's, it settles in at 126 and finishes there. So it speeds up from the beginning to the end about six beats per minute. Um, not insignificant, but um, it, it never, to me, this song was a number one hit. 
I have to think that Jimmy Miller as producer had to be aware that the song sped up during the take. And it was such a, a magical take. I have to think he was, was well aware of that and disregarded the fact that it sped up and, and they kept it because there was just so much mojo and, and soul in this, in this take. Um, and I think a lot of us drummers feel this way that, you know, you can't get hung up on, on BPMs. You can't get hung up on tempo all day long. Um, and to me, this is a great example of, you know, how a song like this can be such a big hit and it doesn't have to be in perfect, ridiculously, you know, click track time. Yeah. So kind of a, you know, a throwback to the good old days. So here's the great honky tonk woman from 1969, Jimmy Miller, starting it off. sped up a little bit right there. Civilians maybe didn't pick up on that. And check it out. The only real drum fill in the whole song is coming up right here. Here it comes. about a masterpiece yeah lots of great comments there as well and I, I know a few of you guys i think it was jody cortez that mentioned you know charlie i uh, sorry that keith was pushing it absolutely you know again everybody knows the secret sauce to the stones is that charlie follows keith that they they play as a rhythm section and uh and charlie would have been the first to say you know he basically follows keith unlike conventional bands where everybody follows the drummer and you hear that in many cases where where you know keith is maybe counts it a little fast or, you know, wants a little bit more behind it and, and that controls the tempo. So, and I just got to give a shout out to my buddy, Don McCauley, who's here watching and Don, man, so great to see you, buddy. Um, yeah, Don and I are going to do one of these, another one of these down the road for sure. And we'll, we'll get into some more specific stuff, uh, based on Don's 10 years working with Charlie. All right. The other thing, too, that um, 
I had another point I was going to make about honky tonk women, I think, which I think I covered, which was, you know, I, I have to think that if, if Jimmy Miller and certainly Mick and the rest of the band felt that that was an issue, the tempo was an issue, they would have cut it again. And that was a pretty magical take. So I think that says it all. Yes. No cymbal crashes either, except at the end and uh, no fills. It's just what makes that song so special. It's Charlie just, man, just that groove. It's just amazing. All right. Going to just sort of jump backwards for a second and play this song, a little bit of this song. And to me, this is a, a great example of why Charlie was so special and, and the discipline that he had when it came to playing for the song and knowing instinctively what not to play. Um, we talk about that a lot, and I think this song is a great example of just how he envisioned this song and what it would, what the drum part should sound like. I'm certain that there was no one telling him to play this this way. I'm certain that he all on his own thought this is, this song is not about me. It's about the lyrics. It's about a, you know, a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a message and I'm not going to get in the way of that. And this song of course is satisfaction. <laughs> song it sounds like charlie is is pushing it a little bit um not speeding up not rushing but definitely playing on top of the beat and just and just driving the song which is exactly what this song needs he's not he's not behind it by any means cut off satisfaction, but we get lots more music to play. And I think that, you know, you, you get the, get the idea on that. Uh, yeah. Tambourine is riding the wave. Absolutely. Um, so this song, I, I, I put these two back to back because I think this next song again from 1969 from the let it bleed sessions is a complete, you know, sort of left turn from satisfaction to where again, Charlie gets to stretch a lot. Um, when I first heard this song as a young drummer, it made such a huge impression on me because I could hear all these different sounds coming from Charlie's little drum set. Um, for example, he's playing the verses, starts off playing halfway through each verse on the ride cymbal, then switches to the hi-hat. Um, does all these accents on the tom-toms, which I, again, I think most people think of Charlie as this drummer that never plays any fills. He's very laid back, um, very simple. But this song to me is a great example of Charlie playing for the song, orchestrating for the song, building a drum part that supports all the different parts of the song, setting up the verses, setting up the choruses, playing these little fills 
and parts that take it to the next place. And again, this is where I think Charlie's playing was just pure genius in, in a song like this. And this is one of my favorite songs, and it's Monkey Man from Let It Bleed, 1969. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I saw a couple of comments about the sound of Charlie's drums. Huge, absolutely huge sounding. And, and that was such a huge part of, uh, you know, the, the recording, the, the engineers. I believe it was Andy Johns that engineered that record. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, he always had a great sound. But that particular record uh, really, to me, stands out. 1969, the, the sound of the drums on that record were just incredible. And I think, I think probably a lot of us know too, that that was the beginning to me, uh, of 
of a change in the way they recorded the stones and the way, the way they recorded Charlie's drums. I mean, you know, some of the older records, it was kind of common for most bands to sort of mix the drums down kind of low. Um, we started to see a little bit of a change during beggars banquet, the record before this one, but in this record, it, the drums were way more prominent. That's a great example. But also on that same record, you hear, uh, live with me and, uh, the studio version of midnight rambler and, uh, give me shelter. And the drums are really, you know, really present and they sound amazing. They just sound fantastic. So, um, so going to move sort of chronologically to the next studio record. Now, by now, Mick Taylor's in the band. The band really sounds different. Um, this Charlie has said, uh, you know, publicly on many occasions that this was his sort of favorite period of the band in terms of what they did, uh, their productivity, the records that they made that period from 1969 to 74 with Mick Taylor and, uh, you know, and I, I know he was proud of records they did after that when Ronnie was in the band, but I know this was a special period for the whole band. Um, but we had talked about this in the past, and this record, Sticky Fingers, the next record after um, Let It Bleed, of course, was a, was a whole different sounding record. The band really kind of went in a new direction, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and I think Mick Taylor being in the band brought everybody's playing up a notch, you know, certainly Charlie stepped up, Keith, Bill, everybody. And uh, this song, no surprise, was a gigantic hit recorded at Muscle Shoals in uh, 1969 during their, their U.S. tour. And uh, I, I believe it was recorded in a couple of days. I mean, it really came together quickly. And Mick has said that he wrote the lyrics, I think, in, in, in an hour or something crazy like that. Um, what I want to point out about this song, which I, I always thought was so cool, is when I was a kid listening to this song, I couldn't really make out what Charlie was playing for the groove. Um, I, I couldn't make out what I could hear the snare drum. I could sort of hear the bass drum, but I didn't know what he was doing with his right hand. Was he playing eighth notes in the hi-hat? What is that? And I remember seeing the movie Ladies and Gentlemen, The Rolling Stones in 1974, and it was a, you know, a video, a, a concert movie of their 72 U.S. tour. And they open with this song. And I'm thinking, I think he's playing the floor tom. I think he's riding the floor tom. And then I had the incredible privilege to see them a year later in 1975, my first time seeing the Stones at the Boston Garden. And I remember really looking closely during that song, and I could see very clearly he's playing the floor tom. That's what he's doing. And then, of course, it all became... Once I really started listening to the record, I, it became obvious that's what he was doing. So anyway, I just think the genius, again, behind the idea of playing the verse on the floor tom, chorus on the hi-hat, um, only Charlie could, could think of that. And the song, of course, is Brown Sugar.
So he's playing the Gretsch um, Black Diamond Pearl kit. Because that's what he was using on that Tour 69. and get you here and get you the idea and you keep your keys at the end. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the end of part one of Track Talk, Charlie Watts' Style and Analysis. Hope you're enjoying it so far. Be sure to check out part two and... Um, Thanks for watching. See you soon. Don't forget to subscribe. See ya.